So our next panel is, <clears throat> is moderated by Dr. Joel Epstein. It is dental care and oral complications of patients with head and neck cancer. And there you go. Well, thank you for the uh, brief introduction. <laughs> but we, need, we have a large topic. So I'm Joel Epstein. I'm uh, an oral medicine provider. I'm at City of Hope and Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. And I'm pleased to be the moderator of the panel who's at the front here. And as you know, this is about dental issues which really begin from the beginning prior to diagnosis, up to through diagnosis, during treatment with acute complications and chronic. And of course, we're gonna talk primarily about survivorship issues initially, but that can be uh, lead us into some uh, discussion of acute management as well, potentially. Uh, I am really pleased uh, with the panel that's uh, here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce them all at the beginning so that as we get through the, the uh, presentations, we have additional time for uh, discussion, and uh, uh, I don't have to interrupt the presenter. So our survivor panelist is Jessica Dagley. She's a mother of three school-aged children. I think you heard her husband uh, make some comments about his part of the journey earlier. Um, she was diagnosed in September 2019. She was 39 years old with uh, an unusual cancer, salivary ductal carcinoma, and she will discuss her a journey and the dental issues that have been challenging. Uh, interestingly, she's a case manager for the Medicaid Waiver Program at Unity of Indiana. Our medical oral medicine and oral surgical experts, Dr. Alessandro Villa is a chief of oral medicine and oncology dentistry at Miami Cancer Institute. He's professor at Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine, Florida International University of Miami. He's an oral medicine specialist, a great colleague. And Dr. Stephen Rosen, who's been involved with this group uh, for decades, um, as, as, as of several of us and, and represented on the board, uh, is chair and professor of surgery and the residency program director oral maxillofacial surgery at Emory University School of Medicine. He's also chief of oral maxillofacial surgery at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Uh, we anticipate uh, active participation from uh, the people attending and those at home, and uh, look forward to the discussion. So first will be Alessandro, correct? No, we're gonna start with you, Jessica. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a head and neck cancer survivor, as you know. And I see a lot of, I see several friendly faces that have treated me here in this room today. But I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm, I have three kids. I have an almost 16 year old boy who is, we're teaching to drive. And I have a 13 year old daughter and a 10 year old daughter. I found out I had cancer in, September of 2019, um, by, I found a hard lump, lymph node in my neck and went to my PCP and he was like, yeah, that's what, everyone gets those, it's fine. But then when he felt it, I could, by the look on his face, I could tell there was something wrong. So after that, I had an ultrasound and then a biopsy and I was told, well, from the ultrasound, I was told that I most likely had thyroid cancer due to a suspicious nodule that I had. I even saw a thyroid cancer specialist. Then after the biopsy, it was, and then they, I, they told me I had a type of salivary cancer. But it wasn't until after the surgery that I had on my neck with Dr. Michael Moore that they told me I had the salivary duct cancer, which is a very poor prognosis, and it usually affects older men. Um, I was 39, had kids 11, 9, and 5, and it was just a shocking diagnosis to have. Um, the treatment plan was very hard to come up, with, come up with because there was just not a lot of research. And I have a friend who's a doctor, her name's Megan Marine, Dr. Megan Marine, who became my advocate. And she did a lot of research on clinical trials and tried to find one for me, but there was nothing available. So she found a study out of Dana-Farber that was based on eight patients and we followed the protocol. Um, the doctors here at IU, at Simon Cancer Center, were willing to do that for me. So I had 32 
radiation treatments, 18 weeks of chemotherapy, and Herceptin for a year, which is a drug that is usually for breast cancer patients, but it was found to be um, going to be beneficial for my type of tumor. Um, almost from the start, I had mucositis, terrible mucositis, mouth sores in my mouth and throat, and I almost, I mean, it seemed like almost immediately I couldn't eat, and I tried, <laughs> and it was so painful, and I, I had a lot of trouble keeping the pain under control, and I saw a palliative care doctor who I worked with to find different pain control methods, um, but that was probably the worst part that I looking back and think about, but I did end up with a feeding tube just like the previous two survivors, and um, I hated it. Um, I hated the social aspect. Um, like my husband said at Thanksgiving, I was just by myself in a room because I was embarrassed, but anyway. Um, I also went to PT for lymphedema. I had, I don't know if you have my pictures, but I had a lymphedema like suit that I had to wear for a while that um, massaged everything and it helped the, the lymph fluid, lymphatic fluid to flush. Um, I wasn't really very good about wearing it after a while, but I never wear it now, probably should still, but um, and I did go to PT for that also. Um, and like my husband said, it was during COVID that I was doing my treatments. And I, so I started going to my treatments alone I couldn't have anyone come with me. I did a lot of my doctor's appointments via telehealth, but I did come to the hospital for my treatments. And um, it was lonely, but I didn't want my family, of course, they couldn't come, but I didn't want them to be put at risk anyway. Um, I had several complications, things that came up during my treatment. I had a salivary duct that became infected and blocked, and so I had surgery to repair that. And I also, um, during a scan, I had a scan at the end of my treatment showing that I was cancer free or that I, that I had no more cancer. And a year, about a year later during a scan, um, Dr. Moore found um, a spot on my lower jawbone that we thought could be possibly cancer. And it turned out after an, a needle biopsy and an open biopsy that it was not. It was osteoradionecrosis, so from the radiation. At that point, I was very excited that that's what it was because I thought it was going to be cancer. Um, no more treatment was needed for that at that time. But then later on, I this is a dental panel, I started experiencing dental problems. I had six crowns that uh, just crumbled off and fell off and would have been a huge financial burden for most people, but my dentist, Dr. Tim Adams, he did all of the repairs for free. So he's amazing. And if you're in Carmel, I suggest going to him. <laughs> but um, then this past February, I had an infection in my lower right molar on my radiation side. And um, I just was assuming that I would get it extracted and move on. No. I went to, after consulting with the dentist and oral surgeon and Dr. Moore, it was determined that I would need hyperbaric oxygen treatments to prepare that bone to have the tooth extracted. So I was not real thrilled about that because that included 40 treatments and it just to me felt like radiation, <laughs> but it wasn't at all. And it was a lot having to go to the hospital every day, but it was and I had to adjust my work schedule and my children's schedule and all that, but it was getting into a chamber and after getting my vitals checked and my ears checked before every time by the nurse practitioner, I would get into the chamber for 90 minutes and breathe in the 100% oxygen and I could watch TV. So I caught up on Netflix, Ted Lasso and naps. <laughs> I had a routine. I would watch one episode. Of, most of the time, I would watch one episode of Ted Lasso, and then I would look at the nurse, and she would turn off the TV, and I'd roll over and go to sleep So <laughs> for the rest of the time. But I ended up being there. It was a 30-minute drive to the hospital. I live in Greenwood and um, just south of here. And so it was a 30-minute drive to the hospital and then about four hours at the hospital every day. So I did that for 30 treatments, and then I had the tooth extracted, 
And then I had 10 more treatments, so 40 total. And I had a, quite a bit of pain still after it was extracted for a while, so they ended up doing a CT and everything looked good and it was healing. And still five months later, it's still not all the way healed, but it's definitely healing. Um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am for all the doctors, nurses, my family, my friends, my neighbors, my church. They all, how much they came together for my family and supported us and loved us through that. I don't think I could have done it without them. Um, I am an ambassador for the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance because I just want to show people there's hope after cancer and that your life can go on. And, and I just want to tell my story to help others that are going through something similar. Thanks. Thank you. thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for sharing your story. And I also wanted to thank all the patients, survivors, and caregivers that are in the room that shared their story earlier. I'm, I'm actually moved. Um, you know, we're used to talk among physicians, but it's different when you talk to your patients, and, and some of them become your friends, and, and we see them all the time. Um, and Tony, you're probably the only Canadian in the room, but I'm the only Italian in the room, so. Uh, <laughs> So um, I'm also an epidemiologist by training. I, I like to crunch numbers, and I apologize for this slide, but it's just to show you that the number of cases in the United States are actually increasing, and so is the number of cases of oropharyngeal cancer, throat cancer associated with HPV. And we are seeing, luckily, also more survivors. And um, Joel and I are both oral medicine specialists, and we accompany patients during their cancer treatment and after their cancer treatment for any mouth complications that may occur following therapy for head and neck cancers. And um, when we look at the complications, this is what Su Yom uh, very well described earlier this morning. Radiation therapy affects the mouth in different ways. Uh, patients may develop dry mouth, a secondary infection, a candidiasis is a yeast infection that is very common in patients who develop dryness, uh, difficulty eating and swallowing because of mucositis. Pain is a big component. We heard that from, from Jessica just a few minutes ago. And then there are also other complications, including osteoradionecrosis, um, and we'll hear about that in a minute. And also um, another complication that we didn't discuss is difficulty of opening the mouth, this is what we call trismus or fibrosis of the muscles. And unfortunately, mucositis um, affects almost all patients undergoing radiation therapy. Uh, these are some of my patients uh, from the very first one, the top left was actually a very young patient. The first one that I saw when I was a resident years ago is a 23-year-old um, guy with a history of rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, who underwent radiation therapy and developed horrendous mucositis. And this guy was just about my age when I was in training. And that was really life-changing for me to see that as a physician and as a provider caring for these patients. And it's also um, associated with high cost for, pay for healthcare in general. Uh, treatment of mucositis, we know that it's associated with about $25,000 cost. A minimum for these patients, and we'll talk about the dental cost in, in a minute as well. And um, luckily now we have some options for mucositis. Dr. Yom showed some of the new drugs in the pipeline uh, earlier today that we use or may be able to use to prevent or treat some of the severe cases of mucositis. Uh, but I wanted to point out a couple of interesting options that we have that are recommended by the International Society of Oral Oncology. Uh, these guidelines came out back in 2020. Uh, one is the use, for example, of honey in patients receiving radiation and chemotherapy for head and neck cancer. Uh, one of the issues there to be careful, though, is that honey has a lot of sugar, and sugar is bad for your teeth. Um, and the second one is the use of photobiomodulation, which is a red light. Uh, this has been done, this has been using for a long time in Brazil. It's now recommended also here in the US. Uh, it's still controversial on several aspects, but there might be a role for 
uh, photobiomodulation in the prevention and treatment of some of these cases of oral mucositis. Um, and uh, dry mouth, we, we saw it already, but um, it's interesting when you see the course, and, and we learn this a lot from our patients, dry mouth usually starts early on during the second or third week of treatment and then tend to worsen over time as, as radiation continues. And it tends to become also a chronic effect uh, with different consequences in the health of the mouth of our patients. Uh, these are all patients who underwent radiation for head and neck cancers, uh, developed severe dryness of the mucosa inside the mouth, and therefore also a secondary candidiasis, which is a yeast infection that can cause burning and pain in the mouth. Um, and not to mention the devastating effect on teeth. Uh, Jessica was, was just mentioning that. Um, these are two pa this is a patient that developed severe um, multiple dental cavities of the teeth because of the dryness. And, and that's why it's really important to see a dentist before starting therapy, but also to follow up with a dental provider after therapy to make sure that if any dental concern arises, it's addressed in a timely manner to avoid any potential extraction and try to save these teeth. Um, pilocarpine is, is a good medication, does come with side effects for the treatment of dryness. We do have two other options uh, for severe dryness. One is a medication called sevamelin. It does a similar thing as pilocarpine, but it acts a little differently and sometimes as uh, less side effects. And then there is a third medication called bethanocol, uh, which does a similar thing. It tells the glands to produce more saliva, and it could be a good option also for patients that do not respond well to pilocarpine and sevamelin. And as you can see here, um, there's different researchers have tried different things to improve the amount of saliva in patients, including acupuncture or, again, low-level laser therapy with some controversial results. It's a 50-50 response, but these are some of the new options that we have available for some patients that uh, do not respond well to topical moisturizers or other medications that increase the salivary flow. And because of dryness and because of chemo and radiation, um, it's not news to all of you here in this room, but uh, taste also play a big role. And we talked about earlier about nutrition and how can we help best help our patients. And one of the issues that taste is, is, is not there anymore. And we, the food tastes different, the food tastes less than normal. And this is a very, very common complication in patients receiving radiation. It can affect up to 50% of patients. Um, but the good, the good news is that most, most patients recover. Um, yesterday at dinner, we were talking with, with a friend and, and uh, also survivor uh, who is also part of our board here at the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance. And he was telling us how taste took a very long time to come back and food didn't taste like anything. And, and this is a, is a big concern, not only for patients receiving radiation, but also some of the patients that undergo chemotherapy. And uh, there is different way uh, that we can address this. Um, we work with nutritionists uh, to make sure that patients can discuss alternative options uh, when the taste is, is lacking. Um, there's also some studies looking at the effect, and, and Joel, Dr. Epstein here, has done a lot of work in, in, in this. Uh, there's studies looking at the role of clonazepam used as a swish and spit to help with some of the taste changes in the mouth. Uh, more recently, at my institution, we started a study looking at the role of gabapentin as a swish and spit for those patients who had a damage of the taste buds from radiation therapy with some good results and very limited um, toxicity profile. So there's definitely some new things that we can do uh, to help patients during the first year post-treatment to help um, recovering some of the taste. Um, at MD Anderson, they did some work using ginger ale as a swish and spit, um, the sugar-free one. Um, patients are usually instructed to rinse before starting to eat uh, with some interesting results and improvement of the taste. So um, again, different ways that we can tackle this. And, and finally, trismos, which is um, 
one of the most challenging, I would say, complication as a provider, but also when I see my patients, so difficulty opening the mouth. Uh, we usually, if you check it, your, your normal mouth opening is usually about four fingers, three fingers. Um, imagine when you can't open the mouth, it's difficult to eat, but it's also difficult to clean the teeth. And it's difficult for us as dentists to access the teeth uh, to make sure that we do a nice exam, good exam, and also uh, clean the teeth on a regular basis. Um, and there's diff trismos is very difficult to treat. Um, um, MD, as always at MD Anderson, they did a large study that was published uh, just last year looking at the effect of manual therapy and physical therapy to improve the opening. That seemed to be the best option available. Um, acupuncture may provide some relief. Uh, the use of pentoxifiline and vitamin E in combination um, has shown some controversial results with patients having some improvement and other patients not so much. Um, so these are some of the things that we can do for patients with difficulty uh, opening the mouth. And um, I just wanted to conclude by showing a couple of newer things uh, for patients who have relapsed head and neck cancers or uh, metastatic head and neck cancer. Immunotherapy is a new treatment approach, uh, in particular with a group of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we looked, um, when I was at UCSF, with some people at Harvard and also with Dr. Epstein, we looked at what are the side effects with these medications. Because uh, yes, there's a lot of new drugs that can fight the cancer, but unfortunately they all come with side effects that can affect the mouth. And we look at about 4,600 patients that receive immune checkpoint inhibitors, and there were three major complications. One, the mouth sores, similar to the mucositis from radiation, large ulcer, large mouth sores, very, very painful. Uh, the second one was dryness, because um, these medications can destroy some of the gland, the salivary gland tissue that produce saliva. And the third one was the taste. So in, in reality, very similar side effects that we see in radiation, but this is with um, what we call immunotherapy, which is a, a, a similar to a chemo drug. Um, we also looked at the benefit of having a dental provider as part of the cancer team. Not all the cancer hospitals in the country have um, a dentist uh, as part of the team. And not only we looked, we looked at the financial aspect, and also we looked at the duration of some of the mouth complications that can happen during and post cancer therapy. And when a dentist is involved in, as part of the care team, not only the duration of the complication is shorter, but also the cost for healthcare in general and the cost for the patient is significantly reduced. Um, so in summary, we really are facing many complications that affect the mouth. And again, I'd like to underline the importance of seeing a dentist before starting therapy, during therapy, and also post-treatment to minimize some of the complications that can happen. It's really a team effort. Um, we see patients together with our colleagues, the radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, speech pathologists, and surgeons uh, to best accompany our patients during their journey. And as part of what we're trying to do, um, we're, we're looking at, uh, as you know, we talked about insurance coverage earlier uh, when we were looking at nutrition. One of the issues with dental care is that it's not covered by medical insurance. Medicare doesn't cover it as of yet, although things may change in the next couple of years. And um, so we're looking and asking for your help as patient and survivors to better understand what is the financial burden um, associated with dental care prior and after cancer therapy. So we have a little survey for you. Uh, take your time, you can take a photo. There's also a flyers outside. Um, this will help us understand again how much is the cost associated with dental treatment when, when a patient has head and, uh, head and neck cancer. And ultimately it will be very informative to better understand how we can fight really with the insurance companies and Medicare and advocate for, for our patients. So uh, thank you and I'm happy to answer any question after uh, Steve's talk. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, thank you. This has uh, been a, a wonderful opportunity both to participate and to be able to, to address you. Uh, by way of, of introduction, I've, I've been part of this board for a long time. I actually came to the board because a good friend of mine was diagnosed very similar uh, story. Uh, uh, this was in New York City and uh, <clears throat> he uh, noticed a node but he actually came to our apartment and uh, said, I've had a sore throat for three weeks and my PCP has given me antibiotics and it hasn't helped. And uh, I didn't have anything except a spoon and a flashlight, but his, his tongue cancer was, was there. And uh, because of his journey, um, I, became interested in, in uh, participating at that time with Terry Day in our, our Georgia chapter, and I'm very thankful that I did. I know I'm also standing between us with our question and answer and lunch, so I will uh, tend to address all of those things and be brief. I do want to call your attention to uh, the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance website, which most of you are familiar with, and if you uh, go on to it and look at um, search for Mike Metzler. Some of you know Mike. Mike was an ambassador here. And the reason uh, I bring him up, he recently passed away actually in Arizona on a vacation uh, from aspiration, uh, kind of something we've talked about. And uh, he, he wrote a book. And I would urge you all to, uh, to get a copy of it and look at it because it's titled, uh, you know, My Two uh, Cancer Journeys. His first journey with cancer and then his second journey with osteoradial necrosis. And it's uh, <clears throat> My Two Cancer Journeys, uh, Team Mike versus the Prairie Dogs. And a very interesting title and uh, he w he's my patient, was my patient. And uh, very much like Jessica's uh, story earlier, uh, the, the uh, complications just keep coming back, much like the prairie dogs that stick their head up and you hit them with the mallet at the carnivals, the whammo. And that's true, and I think that affects us and our, because we're, we're there with you with cancer as your diagnosis and the treatment of cancer is the primary. It's not the treatment of your teeth, it's not the treatment of what goes on, it's osteoarthritis necrosis is not, not part of the vocabulary, um, but it is one of the things that in talking to survivor groups and having friends, as I mentioned, that go through it, it, it becomes an issue afterwards. So I know that Terry didn't have a chance to talk about osteoradial necrosis and time actually uh, is, is uh, also part of what we do. Uh, MK is a 41 year old patient that was diagnosed two years ago with a T2, N0, M0, base of tongue squamous cell carcinoma. She treated it out at an outside hospital with chemo rad for her primary. To date she's disease free. However, uh, her second journey begins. A little bit of background. Uh, clearly with evolving etiologies and advances in the treatment of head and neck cancer, survivor, survival has improved and the number of uh, survivors has continues to grow. Continues to grow, which raises challenges in the oral, dental, ca and needs category. All treatment for head and neck, all treatment modalities uh, do produce oral complications. External beam radiation therapy, and, and Dr. Young talked about uh, the modulation of it, which has certainly been a, a godsend in decreasing the uh, corollary uh, damages by radiation. However, despite all the attention to preserve healthy tissues, the effects on the jawbones, teeth, and gums from radiation and uh, you'll see chemotherapy and other factors produce the, the production of loss of saliva, blood supply lead to the oral complications. Uh, <clears throat> what, is, what is the uh, definition 
of uh, osteoradionecrosis. It is devitalized bone, exposed through the mucosa, following radiation therapy. Usually after three months, the diagnosis is made uh, if there's no tumor recurrence. And there's an example of uh, <clears throat> osteoradionecrosis in the area of the left posterior molar area, panoramic x-ray to, to show the bone loss. Uh, it can be transcutaneous uh, with fistulae, uh, can result in fracture of the jaw, variable pain, secondary infection, and alteration of feeling of sensory nerve that uh, goes through the jaw. The incidence is decreasing significantly, and thank God. Uh, I think that is uh, due to all the efforts of our radiation uh, oncologists and radiation therapy physicians, the uh, support uh, teams with them, and it uh, has made a significant uh, effect. Uh, in the 60s, uh, 11, 12 percent uh, incidence of osteoradionecrosis following radiation therapy down to about 3 percent. Uh, external beam dosing seems to be a factor above 65 gray. There's a higher incidence with brachytherapy and concomitant chemotherapy, so chemo-rad will go on to uh, result in a higher incidence of ORN. With lower dose therapy, uh, less incident. Stage of the tumor, T4 tumors uh, <clears throat> being more, uh, the treatment for those being associated more with uh, osteoradionecrosis incidence, tobacco, alcohol, nutritional status also add. So what about extractions? Interestingly enough, uh, if you're told that you should have your teeth out before the radiation therapy, which many do, um, it doesn't necessarily always eliminate the chance for osteoradionecrosis because the healing of the area may take longer than the window of time between the uh, surgery or the diagnosis and the radiation therapy. Uh, <clears throat> dental and periodontal disease, or dental disease and periodontal disease certainly uh, do set people up for it. So, management. There is really no universally accepted protocol, and you go to one institution, they have common themes, but the protocols are different. Uh, the goal of the treatment for early stage osteoradionecrosis is resolution with maintenance of continuity, meaning that you don't have to remove everything that's there in order to uh, eliminate the, the problem. Hygiene, cleansing, irrigation, Peridex, all of my patients, and I have a fairly uh, robust population of patients that I follow with osteoradionecrosis. Uh, earlier you've heard, actually, in, in by a number of speakers, of pentoxifiline and tocopherol. And that I put all my patients on, a regimen of pentoxifiline and tocopherol. Pentoxifiline is an antioxidant uh, shown to help with the progression of radiation fibrosis, or radiation-induced fibrosis, and the effects of radiation on extracellular and it seems to, soft, soft findings, soft literature, but does seem to help. In fact, we're starting to use uh, pentoxifiline and tocopherol for a sister problem called osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, which some of you may have heard about, which is uh, not an uncommon occurrence now, or I should say not uncommon, not frequent, but not uncommon occurrence uh, for patients taking uh, anti-resorptives for treatment of multiple myeloma, metastatic prostate, metastatic breast cancer, and uh, many uh, women have been on uh, for uh, anti-resorptives, Fosamax being the most common one for osteoporosis. And osteonecrosis and osteoradionecrosis have significant similarities. And so we've started to use pentoxifiline and tocopherol for, for that group also. Intermittent antibiotics, 
debridement of mobile uh, pieces of bone, and for early stage ORN, we see resolution. As you can see here, we'll move along. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, for those that uh, have uh, conditions that uh, we listed, combined chemotherapy or bone exposure, periodontal disease, extractions, <clears throat> continued heavy tobacco and alcohol use, uh, we, have, we see uh, further uh, needs in the treatment of these folks. HBO or uh, hyperbaric oxygen still is controversial. It depends on the institution, depends on the individuals that are treating you. Uh, for a single tooth extraction that Jessica talked about, she went underwent 40, 40 uh, dives, correct? Yes. Um, there are people that will do a single tooth without uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And so the word's not in. Uh, it does have some complications. It is pretty expensive. I think it's like $1,500 per, per dive. And so the, uh, for patients that are covered uh, through Medicare, which is, does cover uh, HBO, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, useful. Uh, <clears throat> with defects, surgery is sometimes uh, inevitable where the dead bone has to be removed. Removing the dead bone produces a discontinuity, and discontinuities of the lower jaw in particular are very problematic, and uh, reconstruction is part of the, uh, the overall treatment plan. Uh, segmental reconstruction, putting plates in only is not, not a uh, good idea because they don't work. Uh, for a long period of time. Here you see a patient that, uh, I'm sorry if it's not clear, but the, uh, there's a pathological fracture through the area of osteoradionecrosis. Uh, there's a, a number of procedures that can be done, but taking bone, skin from uh, an area, scapula, fibula, hip, and bringing it up to the jaw can uh, bring the blood supply up and restore continuity as well as aesthetics function. Avoiding extractions shortly before or after RT, pre-RT considering oral health, selective extractions, and then waiting 14 to 20 days. And I th thank you and we'll turn this back over to Joel who will, I hope, have time for uh, audience uh, participation. See if this is on. Well, thank you to all the presenters. Thank you, Steve. I wanted to mention uh, one thing that the sort of discussion reminds me of, um, that uh, historically dentistry has basically been extracted. The, the mouth has been extracted from the rest of the body. And you can see how that divergence, which also affects insurance reimbursement and coding and all the things that go along with that, come together and come back together uh, as part of cancer therapy. Um, and one question I just wanted to ask to start this, and I know we have limited time, so depending on hard stops, just let us know, and we'll look forward to continuing the discussion of broad, broad topics uh, uh, at the next meeting. Um, but the, uh, the first question that I wanted to bring up was with Jessica. And during the acute phase, what was the worst problem that you experienced and then during the recovery phase prior to the necrosis, what were the complications that you found most impactful? Well, I definitely think the mucositis was the hardest because it was just so painful and I could not eat even, I mean, I wanted to, <laughs> and I could not. Um, and that seemed to last a while. And then, I think just the impact on my children and my family and my friends, just that was difficult to see. Yeah. So basically, in, in, in the, all of oncology, it's pretty much a team sport, a team event involves the individual, the family, the medical team, and the medical team really needs, in our view, to be comprehensive, especially in head and neck cancer. I think there's... Uh, 
one question here. Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. And, and based on time, I was just told that you get the one and only question. So if, if the answer's long, that's, that's another issue. But thank you very much. Thank you, panel, for your uh, delivery. My question is, during my treatment, I wore a mouthpiece on the lower jaw, none on the upper jaw. So the studies and, and effects that you displayed here, was that patients that this happened with a mouthpiece, or was the mouthpiece of little importance in my, in my current dental hygiene? What was the purpose of that mouthpiece? And again, should I have worn an upper and a lower? I, I am not have a mouthpiece. ORN, what, what happens? Uh, was the mouthpiece during radiation while you were receiving treatment, or? Absolutely. Maybe. So my point is, is the studies that you talked about, was that for patients that had some type of cancer where they couldn't wear a mouthpiece, or that can still occur even if I did wear a mouthpiece? I, I think, Zaki, I'm here, but uh, the, the, uh, that's protection. It's protection for the teeth. Um, the teeth can uh, be affected, as can bone, uh, not just from the loss of saliva, uh, but also the radiation effects on the teeth have some, there's some effect. And by putting a mouthpiece in, depending on where the radiation is and, and uh, how it's modulated down perhaps and, and localized, uh, it is a way to pr protect the teeth. And I think most radiation therapy units will, will, uh, will put it in. I suspect maybe they gave you, uh, the, the radiation was lower and it was, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think I had a pretty high dose of radiation, but I did not have a mouthpiece. Did not. And, and yeah, sometimes I, I, it's also to keep the mouth in a certain position, so uh, I'm not sure, but maybe Sue Yom can also comment on that. But um, Yeah, I, I think I could do that because Sue doesn't have a mic. Um, I, partly it's to displace tissues in and out of the field. Probably they were trying to either open the bite or displace tissues so that the radiation can have lower effect on, on say, a, a critical structures like bone, if possible. So not everybody will have a, a pre-treatment device fabricated before radiation because the radiation therapy may have to reach certain points. It, and it really depends on the treatment planning itself. That's not the fluoride applicator trays or the other medication trays that we frequently use, so that's, that's different. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, great session, great uh, material. And um, so now we're going to transition to lunch. But um, if you'll recall, we do have three uh, focus tables. One uh, initially was going to be on dry mouth.